Um, I want to thank Max and Julia for joining us again tonight. The, they're the authors of the book we've been reading. Um, I think we have some people from a couple of the different cohorts, which is good. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we've, got, we've got a handful of questions that have been submitted, but please feel free to ask questions um, in the chat. And then um, like once we run out of the questions that were submitted, we'll just let people unmute and ask questions um, one at a time, please. Uh, but we'll, we'll get there. So to start things off, uh, Tony asked, uh, how close is Tidy Models to being uh, like stable? Are you going to get to a 1.0 anytime soon? That's kind of an arbitrary. Right? I mean, it's yeah. a tough question. We so, could do it tomorrow. We could just read on. Well, yeah. But at 1.0, that you're happy calling a 1.0. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well, different pieces of it are at different levels of maturity. And so that's, um, that's something to keep in mind, I think. Um, so, you know, like the core, uh, I'll, I'll say in something and you can reflect on this, Max, to see what you think, like the, like the core pieces, like I need to do feature engineering, I need to train a model, I need to evaluate my model, you know, those are things that, um, you know, we see as, as, um, as, as quite stable. Um, I, I um, and, and like, we, we know there are people who are using it in, production or close to production systems. And we keep that in mind when we make changes to it. Um, you know, like these things that, you know, if you are reading the book and you're like, wow, they've just added this chapter or there were just, you know, like we're not really even caught up to where they're writing or whatever. Like, obviously those are things that are much more immature and um, aren't, aren't there yet. So, um, so those would be things like workflow sets. Um, so I don't know if you have any similar or different thoughts, Max. I agree. We're doing our best. And I think, I think we're doing fairly well at keeping the API stable. Um, and we're trying to limit breaking changes as much as possible. Um, I think sometimes it may seem less stable than it actually is because we are usually trying to find better, you know, we, we it's not like a, like you're the alpha testers, but at the same time, like once things get in use a bit, we want to be like, oh, oh, well, Okay, so people don't know the difference between bake and juice usually. So let's just not get rid of juice, but maybe think about the API a little bit different. Or the same thing with workflow sets. It was something like I've been resisting doing for a while or in different shapes. And I was like, oh, actually, you know, we should do this. So I think what we'll be doing is we'll be adding complementary APIs that might be better than the original ones, or at least we think based on feedback. Um, like, you know, there was a question earlier about like, you know, uh, what was it like using last fit and like you have two data frames, right? And, you know, and I just put it in our Slack, like, oh, we should actually have a function that just does that. Like, <laughs> like you can do it, but like, why wouldn't we, if that's, if enough people are asking for that and I think maybe they are, then, you know, maybe we should just have a function where you give it two data frames and we label them and it comes out a really split, split, you know, object. Um. I think that that leads really well into another question that Tony asked. Um, just can you kind of talk through your process when you're deciding on um, his example was a supplementary function like rank results from workflow sets, where it's something that the user could just do, but um, you give a convenience function to pull that out. And how do you decide which ones to actually make the own their own function versus kind of let people do it themselves. Is my dog hacking up? Maybe you start with that. Like, <laughs> <clears throat> um, I think that's a really, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, and like as a tool builder, um, you know, like at some level you're like, well, why are we writing functions at all? Why are we writing packages at all? <laughs> Everyone just do everything yourself. Do it all yourself. Um, and, and, you know, the same for me, right? Like, like I, I, and I think about, um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I think about a package like use this and you're like, this was all stuff that you could do, right? Like in R or with other tools. And, but the fact of um, thinking about what are the tasks that are being done, um, 
uh, be a little opinionated about what is the best way to do them. Um, and then making it fluent for people to do them like that's, that's a big part of what I think being a tool builder is about. And I, that applies, I think, equally well in like the machine learning modeling sphere as it has in like all the other spheres I have ever spent time building tools in, you know, like whether it was internal tooling um, to be able to access the data or, you know, like other open source stuff I worked on. Max, I don't know if you want to specifically reflect on like that function a little bit, why you were like, oh yeah, we need this. Sorry, which one was it? Uh Sorry, it was uh, the specific example he gave was rank results and workflow sets. Oh, right. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, so for some of I mean, let, I'll take maybe two different examples and that, that'll be one of them. So that's something where it was like the package is kind of de novo. So it wasn't like we did stuff and we we're like, oh, you know, but we should be able to do this. Um, that, that was like an internal function I needed for like auto plot. But then I was like, well, people are going to want that data. Um, so in that particular case, it was just like, yeah, we should expose that and make the IP, API, you know, add some things to it. Um, so I think that one's more straightforward. I just looked up the function name. And another example is in our sample, uh, we added a function called reg intervals. And that's something where I think for like LM and GLM, you could like just give it, a, I think like a formula in a data frame and it'll fit a bunch of bootstrap models and give you confident, the bootstrap confidence intervals, like efficiently. Um, and that's something I think like Mine suggested, um, you know, it was a combination of things she was doing with infer and teaching and stuff like that. So, so it's like this weird like contrast where like we'll hear from people and be like, yeah, that's a good example. But then at some point we gotta be like, oh, we got all these functions rolling around. And it does, it does at some point like generate some confusion because people are like, wait, there's like four functions for confidence rules with the bootstrap. Like, what do I do? So, you know, in, in the perfect world, we would have like converged to the right uh, set of APIs initially. Um, but, you know, we, I think maybe unlike other um, software or other, maybe even other languages, I think we, we tend to be like in tidy versus like this, you know, let's you know, pivot wider, that seemed better than spread gather. Like, you know, so we're, I think we're willing to try things and give people, you know, it's very unpythonic. Like, you know, there should be one and only way of doing thing. You know, we don't really do that because we sort of want to like, um, if, especially in the modeling space, we want to just evolve the APIs because sometimes it's really, really hard to know across all models and things like that, like what you should be exposing and how it should be. Set up. So it's, it's basically kind of subjective. Um, but at some point we have to be like, oh yeah, uh, let's not add too many things because then people are just going to be like, wait, what do I do? And, and a good example of that is, and this has come up and, and it, it'll be in the workflow sets talk. Like, you know, people are like, well, wait, I could build like a parsnip model and a recipe. So why should I use a workflow? Like, do I have to use a workflow? And so if you think about like what you could give like to the model tune functions, it could be like, it could be a bunch of different stuff. And that was to increase flexibility, but at the same time, it has the, has the consequence of people being like, well, wait, do I need to do that? Why would I do that? What is that? And there's just a lot of stuff floating around. And, and that's been a little bit of a, uh, we've been hearing a lot about that. Um, I'm not sure there's much we can do about it besides just like education and training and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and the education training piece is really interesting. An example came to mind in a package that we do actually maintain, but isn't like part of core tiny models. That is core, C O R R R, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lots of R's. And it is a package for like dealing with correlations. And somebody recently posted something like being like, hey, I want to make a table. Um, you, we should have table functions, like course should have table functions. And, um, the, the sort of education piece really came to the forefront. Cause you're like, actually we recently added this kind of flexible function. That's like map, but for these core data frames where you can map like any function you want, you know, over these, um, like sets, like a pair pairs, I guess. And, um, uh, and you, you know, you can use that to get out everything out of a test, like a core test that you can use. And then, you know, like make a little function for everything you want 
to go in a table and then map and then knitter cable and bam, you have a table, you know? And so it's like, uh, and so that, so this is, it's kind of an issue of, this is super subjective, right? Like it's like taste, um, experience, um, input, like from people like you, right. Of like, okay, this is an example that I'm pretty sure everyone's tables are going to be, have to be slightly different and we don't want to be opinionated about it. So let's just show people how to do it so they can adjust it. And then something like workflow sets, we're like, you know what? We think based on how much feedback we've gotten over and over that this is a task people, um, people want to do, and it has a similar shape every time they do it. And so we want to make it easy. Yeah. And one last example, hopefully it's the last one, like in the, so I, I was showing everybody the notes for the workflow sets talking about the give. And I have an example where basically you give a formula, like, you know, whatever model formula or whatever. And then, um, and then it does like leave variable out. So it figures out all the variables in the formula and then removes them and any interactions are involved with. And, and that creates a list of formulas. And, and so what you can do is you can make like a performance assessment. You could say, oh, well, if I remove like displacement from empty cars, how bad does the RMC get without it? You know, and that, that's basically like a likelihood ratio test, but we can use it with other metrics like R squared or whatever. And so then you just bootstrap that and you get a bunch of estimates. And, you know, in, and in the notes, it's like, you know, the workflow sets bit is maybe like 20 lines of code. And then there's like a GG plot that's like another 20 or 30, you know, so it's not like a ton of code, but I think Hannah was like, or somebody was like, yeah, we should make a function out of that. And initially I was like, mm, like they could just, take that code. But then as I started to think about it, like earlier today, I thought actually, but if they're using a recipe that might get hard to program again. So there's things where I'm like, oh, okay, that in the general case, that might be kind of dicey. So maybe it would be good for us to have a, a function that does that, that maybe will be in workflow sets because it's using workflow sets um, to just quantify the like importance of your predictors based on that sort of strategy. And, and, and again, the only reason I would think to really add that besides saying like, hey, just copy the code and like, you know, add your stuff in is that there are some situations where like if you add a recipe, then you have to figure out all the terms that are generated by, generated by the recipe and then set up a formula to leave those out and then put it back in the workflow and then blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, yeah, we should do that. So, yeah. Makes sense. Um, that on a somewhat related note to that, uh, the next, you're like walking through Tony's uh, series of questions here, because the next one he's got is, um, what's the design process like for creating the auto plot functions? Um, how do you decide what geoms to use, when to use fa facets, etc.? Because um, he says that you know they've all they've all been great. So, what what goes into that? Is it just you try plotting things and then auto plot is what you liked? Yeah. <laughs> some of it some of it holds over from carrot so like in carrot i was like you know for like the the tune auto plots that like i did a lot of work uh with a collaborator on like you know god knows how many like tuning parameters you have and how many values they have so it came up with like an algorithm for like regular grids like oh, wait which one goes on the x-axis it should be the thing that has the most values and then what do we color by and this is i mean don't, don't tell anybody, this is when we were doing Lattice. So it was like pre ggplot that I was working on this. If you can believe there was a time before ggplot. Um, so like sometimes, you know, I put a lot of thought into it, but other times it's like, oh, this seems like, I mean, for me, like autoplot is like, we always, I think we always expose the data that makes that up. It's like a convenience function. So it's never like, oh, I can't make that because I don't have the underlying code functions. So it's really just meant to be like um, like an 80% thing where, you know, it'll probably do well for getting the message across for like 80% of the time. And I think maybe in the book, I remember Julie and I having a conversation about this for some analysis and it was like, oh, the autoplot kind of does it. I think it was for tidymodels.org, but we ended up writing our own function just because it looked a lot nicer and we could like optimize it. So my feeling is like, if you're working you know, like I used to do, and it's like, well, you, you generate this plot to just figure out, you know, internally, like what's going on, but you'll probably like make something much more um, pristine or much more perfect for your situation that you're going to show to your boss. So it's like, yeah. oh, what conveys the most information that'll hit most of the use cases? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm on the picky side for plotting for like visualization, and so I think that like that's the way I like to think about the auto plot methods is that they're really good for like interactive use when you're during model development and kind of giving you like a kind of place to step off from um, for communication. All right. Um, so you mentioned carrot. Is there is there anything that you would that you kind of wish you had done that you if you were doing like a new vegetable, if you were doing this a third time that you would third, do no. different? <laughs> Another <laughs> vegetable. Yeah. If, no. if you were if you were making potato or oh, uh, rhubarb, I don't know whatever the next one would be. Like if we were starting yes. again, again, yeah, like round three. Yeah. Like how many oh, times yeah. can you do this, Max? Is the answer no? No way. How many times do you have it? <laughs> how many, man? I mean, I, you know, I, how do I say this? Um, okay, okay, okay. Here's what I'll say. Okay, uh, I wouldn't do it a third time, and I, I think the the main reason is, um, and this might seem like a downer the way I'm going to say it, is I think we have a lot of our code that's sort of like I don't want to say sunsetting. But you know, there's some core pieces of code or packages that may have been designed in like the 80s, you know. And and the thing is, a lot of them. And, and I'm, I mean, I'm like this. I know other people are like this. Um, uh, I think that when we when we make packages, a lot of times it's for our own personal use, and then we put it on CRAN, and then it becomes everybody's use, right? And so, and I like to think that, especially with Carrot, I was like, oh well, no, I wouldn't really have that as a thing I would do but sure like that seems reasonable and and all that but there are, are a lot of other people who are not like that like um, I won't mention packages but we're but you know we we have to do like a lot of work to make our packages like well-known our packages more functional because I think their their users are like well no these are the things that I want to do and if somebody wants to do something that seems reasonable, but it's not something I would want to do, I'm not going to touch my code and mess with that. And so, you know, there's a lot of things like, like you might have a package that doesn't have a formula method and they'll do all sorts of things, but they just won't add a formula method. You're like, add a formula, man. <laughs> like for God's sakes, man, you know? And so like, um, and so I think that, um, and we've been talking about this, we don't have any plans or anything like that, but, you know, I have been raising it like to the R Foundation people saying like, you know, there are a lot of people I think they're going to be retiring from R and S, you know, let's say in the next 10 years uh, or so. And, you know, nobody's going to know how to manage those packages. I mean, honestly, like Carrot, I mean, Carrot was like, I mean, it works and everything and I feel good about it. But under the hood, it's not quite a mess, but it's like, it's not well, you know, it's like one of those, it's like one of those like, like uh, ancient cities where they do an archeological dig and they get to the bottom like, oh, wait, they built that on top of a city. And then they keep going. And, it, and it, the way it was designed over time in my spare time, like, you know, I pity anybody who would have to manage that. And I think there's like a lot of our packages are out there. So, I mean, to, this is a little bit tangential to your question, but like, no, I wouldn't do it a third time. I've, I have wallpapered over so much stuff. Um, for good reasons and for bad reasons that I, no, I would never do that again. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, if the question is like, is there anything in tidy models that you wish you had done differently? Um, maybe um, there's stuff that, you know, I think, I think one thing I would, how oh, yeah, should I say this out loud? Like one thing <laughs> that I think I wish I'd done is like worked with Davis to develop hard hat first and then just have, Parsnip use hard hat. That would have saved a lot of time and a lot of effort because uh, they sort of have parallel implementations of the same kind of thing. And they, I think they mostly agree, but just by nature, they're sometimes are not. So there's like little things like that. Um, yeah, I don't, I can't think of much. I can't think of much that tiny models won't, doesn't do now or won't eventually do that. I would say like, oh, we really missed an opportunity there. If anything, okay, here's what I'll say. If anything, in hindsight about Tuddy models, Tarif, our CEO Tarif and I had this sort of good-natured uh, uh, argument where he claims that they were like offering me a job like three or four years earlier than I started. And they did no such thing. 
They'd be like, hey, Max, how's it going? And they were like, what are, they, they thought like, I'd be like, oh, can I work there? And I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't. Uh, so if I had started like four years earlier, then I think, I think it would be, the design would have been different. So that's, that's something I wish I'd done differently. Do you think, <laughs> how to say it, do you think it would necessarily like have ended up, I mean, was waiting a good or a good thing overall for the, for Tidy yeah. I mean, in some ways, because like, like Arlang wasn't written, uh, right. Tidy Slick wasn't written. And so it would have like, I think it would have accelerated some of those things, but I can't imagine like doing Parsnip without those tools. And as I, I should say also, like when I was first writing Parsnip, it was when Lionel was first writing Arlang. And that was a very, very difficult process. Um, just because like quasi quotation was being invented and APIs <laughs> change. And uh, so I can imagine if it had been years earlier when it was just, you know, like Hallie Winston and, uh, and Garrett, um, like what that would have been like. Um, I don't know, but yeah. All right, let me pull this back up. All right. Um, so uh, August asked, um, a lot of time series modeling processes are done through time TK and model time. Are there any plans to um, expand any time series offerings within like recipes and parsnip or is it kind of intentionally over in its own world? <clears throat> I mean, so we like, you know, Max and I are both like employees of our studio working on like core tidy models, but these are open source packages and we want to build um, a framework that is extensible, like in the way that ggplot2 is extensible, right? Like you, like we, it is something that other people can build upon. And there are people in the community, you know, like Matt Dancho, who um, work a lot with time series and is really excited about building, um, like building tools for things like time series within the tidy models um, framework. So I think when, um, uh, uh, you know, I think when it comes to things like that, like our goal is to be like good collaborators, um, available for code review, available to, um, uh, to like make that process go smoothly, to be able to make sure like this all works together and anybody who is wanting to start something like that um, has what they need to succeed. Um, but I, we don't necessarily feel like we have to own every single thing. Yeah, we can't. And so yeah. like, like if somebody's somebody in a, and I'm not a time series person, so I should like I'm the last person you went doing that. But like if there's somebody who knows what they're doing and they're making stuff and we don't have to, that's great. <laughs> um, another good example is like model explainers and all that. Like there's like a bunch of packages and like we facilitate that by giving them what they need to make it work with tiny models. But I don't I don't see the point of writing another real package to do that because like it's already been done and why would we, I mean, there's things, I mean, I like Daleks, but there's things about it I don't like, And but I'm like, eh, like I'm not gonna rewrite that because I don't like their color scheme. There's like one thing, yeah, that you're like, well, I would have done this slight thing differently. You're like, no, exactly. yeah, yeah. Like there are these really great tools and like, how can we um, be good community members and make it so that things work well together? All right, well that, let's see, let me gather up a couple of questions that kind of go into that arena. Um, to start with, so you have that section in uh, chapter eight, future plans, where you talk about post-processors, uh, such as prediction cutoffs. Why did we do um, that? <laughs> did I, did I, why did I do that? Yeah, 8.7, it changed because it also talked about- do that? Yeah, it talked about workflow sets basically. And then oh, it was edited sure recently because you deployed it. Um, oh, right. So are the things in there like officially future plans or is that just something you were musing while you were writing <laughs> chapter eight? <laughs> I'm going to say the things that are in here are things that are real plans. Because I, I did a round of edits where I took out some stuff that I was like, <laughs> we are saying this, but like, we're not going to do this for a long time. Like, let's take this out. Um, <clears throat> um, so I think the stuff that's in here is like real plans. I mean, I would say within a year, I you know, roughly. I mean, maybe that's I don't, I'm not going to commit, 
<laughs> I'm not going to commit. Don't hold me to that. But like on the order of that, like, yes, this is something that we want to, to do for real. Yes. And I think the main ones that we've been thinking about are things that are really on, you know, you won't see much change in the front end, but on the back end, like a great example, this is case weights. It's like goddamn case weights. So like, I mean, the thing is like, it seems like it's a simple thing, but it's actually, when you think about it, like carrots, not doing it right. MLR is not doing it right. Like, honestly, if you think about what should be happening, uh, which now well, we have, you have to decide what right is, you know, and what are people yeah. expecting? Like, what do people mean when they say they want case yeah. weights? What do they mean exactly. for what purpose? And in what context, like, what do they mean? So like, I, I'll just talk about carrot, like carrot will, will fit the model with case weights, but it doesn't resample thinking about case weights. It doesn't measure performance thinking about case weights. And so you think about all the recipe steps we have and all like the model is like the, actually the easy part. And so like, here's the thing that we deal with is like, because we're expanding the capabilities of our, we have to explain a lot, like, well, why is it complicated? So if you think about like LM and you like weights equal weight or whatever your column is, like in LM, it's, it's fitting the model. It's not doing any resampling or anything like that. Cause it's basically doing like adjusted R squared and things like that. And, and since all of it's, well, it's two metrics that it calculates for performance are built in. It doesn't, you know, it's pretty easy for them to just do it. Right. But now you think about all the metrics we can measure models by. And you think of like things like, oh, we resample the model or we do this or we pre-process with PCA. Well, the case weights ought to come into PCA, right? Like, like, and, and so it's really, um, it's really comprehensive, um, you know, like, and it depends and it's even more complicated because sometimes your case weights are like frequency weights. Like I had the same data pattern a hundred times and I only have a hundred rows. But then like sometimes case weights are like observation level case weights. Like if you have data over time, you might downweight really old data. So they're not like frequency weights. And how would you resample, right? So like if you resample one row and it has, like let's say you have 10 rows of data and their case weights are like five, six, one, three, and you have another one that's a hundred, right? When you resample that, what where should that data go? Should that all just go into training or test or do you split it based on like something? So it's, it's really a lot more complicated. And now that we have the time to really think about this stuff we're, um, we're really thinking about it. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something. Yeah. So, but yeah, I think the things that are in there after, now everybody's going back to like get blame or whatever and looking to see what you took out, which I don't even remember what it was, but <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's all solid. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, if you took it out since the, the book club, you can just watch our meeting from last week because we talked about all the things that had changed in the book since we started reading. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so I, I guess uh, you, you somewhat covered this, but um, Tony was basically asking for uh, a preview of Chapter 18, um, explaining models and predictions. Are there any? Are you recommending other packages in there? Are you? You know, what's that going to be looking at? Yeah, yeah. So that will be that will be using largely um, like showing how to train a model with tidy models, or training a looking at a couple examples, and then how do you go about building model explanations using other um, you know tools in the our, our ecosystem. So um, two that you know we have existing relationships and collaborations with our um, our VIP, the VIP package, and Daleks. So both have support for either parsnet models or tidy models, to total like whole workflows for some of those. And um, uh, so uh, that chapter is um, going to be something like um, um, <clears throat> um, like what is a, like what kind of model explanations can you build? You can build them at the, at the like global whole model level. You can build them for individual observation levels. Um, what are, what are the approaches you can use to do those two different kinds of things? And then, um, how, you know, sometimes you use individual level of like observation level, um, uh, explainers or like feature importance to build back up to a to a model level one, um, and then when when you might use Daleks, when you might use VIP, um, that this is kind of a general um, 
you know, we might mention some of the other packages that are out there as well, but that's, that's, that's where that's headed. So yes, not, not a new package written by us for model explanations, but rather these, you know, really fully featured approaches that exist already in R. How do you use them with your, um, with your tidy models um, results? All right. Um, we had a couple of questions come in while we we're talking, so these aren't fitting into the flow quite as perfectly. But um, so we had a question from um, Apurva. Uh, can you just describe what the process is like? We kind of touched around this, but from ideating a function until you deploy the API, like what what iterations do you go through internally? How how far does it get before we see it? <laughs> I'll start with that. Uh, it really, it, it's much like writing a book with a collaborator, Julia. <laughs> Julia, you should turn your video off for a minute so I don't get to see your reaction. Like, okay. So it's really person dependent. So uh, like I take like Kel Johnson, who I wrote two books with, and Davis are kind of similar in that they're super methodical and they're like, oh, I don't want to put anything down until it's like really what it should be. I am the, I'm like a living genetic algorithm of like, I just like deposit stuff on the page and code. And then I like come back that afternoon and mess with stuff and then blah, 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 and mess with it and, and iterate. Like I really iterate a lot and it starts off as a mess and I like to think it gets a lot better. Um, so I, it, it depends on this, what we're doing. It depends on like, um, but as an example, like Tune, you know, I had all that in my head after doing everything with Carrie and it's hard to like, it's hard, it's a really, it's a very complicated like set of things to do. And so I just remember it was just like Davis and I and me walking through, all right, what well, should do, like here's the main loop and here's, but there, but for Glimnet it ought to do this. And then for models where you can do like submodel predictions, it should do this. And then there's this other thing that, you know, for these models, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and the logic was all there, but it's like, it's not clean. And, and I think Davis likes clean. And I think it like really- Davis likes out. clean, it is true. Yeah, and so like, and part of it was like, I mean, I did everything I could to like document that well. So what I ended up doing, just to, to where I'm going with this is like, what I'm doing is writing some like scripts to be like, all right, let's just write some for loops and stuff. And it's not the implementation, but at least it will get at all the phases of all the things that we do. And, and then that kind of was able to sort of like frame everything for him. Um, and so then, so, you know, so then we wrote a bunch of stuff. Um, we figured out like the main set of functions. And, and if you look at Tune, there's like, I think I had a function named like quarterback or something at some point, because it had all the, like the ways you would go through the code path, right? Because there are certain things you do in certain cases. And, um, and I think at one point Davis just spent like a week or so just like putting all that in memory, like literally like <laughs> in his memory, and then found a much more streamlined way of doing it. So it was a very, very iterative process because the thing that you're trying to, the, the, you know, it's a, it's a huge scope thing and it's a mess. I mean, it's, it's a mess because models are so different and implementations are so different. Like if we were, if we were doing something that was, I don't want to pick on like ggplot or something like that, but like ggplot is pretty small in scope if you think about it. Like, you know, we have GMs, you have chords and you have like a set of things there, you know, there's a menu and you pick from the menu. It's not like somebody comes up, you know, you don't see often that people come up with some new or, you know, some new type of plot that then you have to, but it's different. So you have to like do something with both geoms and chords. And, and so that's what the modeling situation is, is it's such a um, varied heterogeneous group of things that we're trying to put into nice tidy, you know, boxes that um, the things that we tend to do, especially at the high level like tune or just, you know, it's not that the, I don't think it's that the design process is a mess. It's just the thing that you're trying to converge to is not very um, clean. And so, so that's something we have to iterate like a lot. Um, but there's the, no, things are not like workflow sets wasn't like that. That was like a couple of days of just thinking like, oh, I mean, I think we spent more time trying to figure out what <laughs> workflow or was it workflow map should be called. That yeah. was probably more time than most of the development. And that because it's a relatively small in scope package. 
So, and so, so that's how I do stuff. Like Julia does not do it that way. She's much more like refined about how she does stuff. I think, well, yeah, I mean, I think I'm a little, the, the other thing I was going to maybe reflect on that is I have, I have not spent as much time making up stuff when nothing was there as like I either in my in various jobs I've had like as a data scientist or um you know like I like even when it, like m- most of the packages that I maintain I took them over from someone else um uh so I have a lot more experience in like I am coming to this complex system and understanding it and like what needs to be done to like inch it towards you like fix problems slash inch it towards being better or easier to understand. So I, um, so I, I don't know. I just, I just think I have like less experience, like making stuff up for nothing. Cause I just have like over and over and over come to like really, really like complex systems and that exist already. And, um, start dealing with them all right um well i guess somewhat related to that so uh osma asked on the tidy models website uh we're encouraged to provide documentation help when looking at issues on github how can we pick which ones we can help on and what mistakes have contributors made that we should look out for before submitting anything That is a great yeah. question. I would say um, just like put in an issue. Be like, hey, could you use documentation on this? And then we can discuss it there. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't say like, I don't think there's anything where I've been like, why did the contributor do that? I mean, <laughs> I mean, sometimes I think if anything, like the only times I get frustrated by stuff is when people, they don't have to consult us. But at the same time, I think that... Um, and there's a number of like parsnip packages that don't really work with anything else. Like they just fit the model, but the way they designed everything makes it almost impossible to integrate into the broader architecture. And if they had asked like, or talked to us and said like, hey, is there anything I need to know? I mean, there's a lot in the documentation that didn't even really, or maybe they weren't interested in it, but it was just something that like, well, it works for one model fit, but if you're trying to do other stuff, it's not gonna, you know, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. It seems like a lot of work to only get like 10% of the benefit. So like we, and I don't want this to sound like, you know, you must come to the mountain and profess like, oh, please help us. See, we don't, you know, it's not like that at all. We just want to like collaborate with people. Um, not like we're going to tell you what to do, but we're like, oh, you know, so like I saw a package that was doing like um, semi-supervised learning. So basically you have a lot of unlabeled data. How can you incorporate that into your model? I think that's really cool. And they have like a parsnip package to do that, but there's no way it can work with any of our stuff. So, you know, I, f- I find that that's kind of a loss because, you know, it may, again, like it, it might be a situation where like, oh, it does what we want it to and no more because that's what we need to do. Um, and I guess that's fine, but it just seems like a missed opportunity. So anyway, but for documentation, all that, yeah, just put a put an issue into like tidymodels.org and, and like either a list if you want prioritized or like, you know, yeah, discuss it with us. If the question was more about like, I, I saw the suggestion, but what does that mean? And I don't know, like, what is that? Like, is there, are there existing problems? There are actually existing identified problems in the documentation. If you're saying I am interested in working on those because and they are good things to start with because, um, because, because, if you're a user, you like pretty much only someone who has used these functions and understands how they work is able to write documentation to let or make the documentation better and fix it. And um, it is a good place to start because you're not like working with the innards of it, but you're getting into these habits of like, I can make a pull request, all this kind of thing. And I mean, I just was looking and like, I'm going to drop in the, in the chat, like dials, like has quite a number of like documentation issues open, right? Like it's like, oh yeah, like dials needs some documentation help and, you know, recipes has a couple open. So um, if the question was more about that, um, so we're both open to like user saying, I didn't, this is not clear. This is a problem. And also like there, there are existing problems that we have not quite gotten ready 
or, or dealt with. I think if you look at the recipes repo, some of those are labeled um, tidy dev day, like for tidy verse dev day. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that's actually happening. We talked about it, but I don't know if it's going to actually about a happen. virtual one. But I haven't right. heard anything about it. I know. So I'm thinking it's not. So but, just but. do them. Like, don't leave them. <laughs> just like, feel free to do yeah. them. Like, versus. But I think the next one would be in like, whenever the conference is next year. Like our studio conf, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. There was this. There was discussion of trying to do one around use our, but I think with some of the other stuff that's happening this summer, I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. So um, anyway, feel free to go nuts <laughs> if you want to. And, you know, it depends on your, your tolerance for like, not work, but like, I, I used to have a guy who worked for me when I was in drug discovery, who never wanted to work on a project that wouldn't like go into people like drug discovery. Right. And it's like, dude, that's like one out of a hundred. Right. Right. So, you know, it, so, you know, I, I think a lot of times with like software development or stuff like this, you have to, it's, to me, it wouldn't be great. Like if somebody puts a PR for in for something and they just approached it from a way that, um, doesn't really it may address the symptom not the underlying problem i feel bad because they probably spent like a lot of work so like you know draft prs are always great too like you know even if it's just like an outline like oh you know i was thinking about working on this here's what i think the outline of it would be i'll use this data set like there's really no, very low cost for doing that and then um, you can just keep iterating and discussing it so yeah and i mean i'll say you know if you see a typo or something i know that you like welcome those because oh, I, I find those during the book club uh, from time to time to time and submit them. So, um, and also don't get discouraged if, say, for example, PR sit there for uh, a long time through a pandemic and people are distracted on other things and then uh, they get closed because that also happens and it, it was good. So, <laughs> yes, yes, that did happen. Yeah, that did, is also that... important. Yeah, um, and and. Uh, like there are, you, you do have labels on a lot of the issues depending on the, the project of, you know, good first issue or documentation or different things like that. And so, um, you know, I have done some of these and it's just, just dive in to some degree, but don't go too far if you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> and we do have like, I'll, I'll link to, we do have like a contributing guide that outlines kind of yep. like, here would be the steps to get started. Um, maybe I can find it in the dials one. Um, and, and, but there's, there's a similar one in, um, in all the, all the tidy models, uh, repos. So there's, there's the dials contributing guide that says like, here's kind of how you do some of these things. Um, uh, you know, here's how the packages work together a little bit here, the kind of tests that we run, uh, you know, just got kind of some things, some norms for you to, um, know about. And it's not going to be soon, but if you can make it and get a ticket to like the, the dev days, they're very, um, it's it's a good time. I mean, it's a good time in the sense, I think, where everybody wins where, I mean, I, I was describing this to somebody, oh, one of my best friends is an economist and he introduced me to an economist who works at like on Wall Street. And we were talking about this, it's like, so people pay like five bucks to come into your room so they can fix your stuff your stuff your your bugs yeah and it sounds awful the way you do it but like people get like a lot out of it people yeah. um people really like we're sitting there with them at their computer like yeah okay that's that's a good way to write a test case we're like oh no like maybe approach it from this standpoint so if it's something um you have any interest in like the software development side of thing it's it's really quite nice um the downside is there's a limited number of times we do it and a limited number of seats so yeah. that could be Difficult. The reason it's a limited number of seats is because it is very hands-on and it's like people will literally help you get your get situation fixed. Yeah. You know, like like it is limited because it is very high touch. Jenny and Jim are like this the SWAT team. They, <laughs> they just like have a little cult over there. Or they're just like getting get vaccinate everything and sit reps and making <laughs> all that work. So yeah, I I highly recommend um if you have a chance to go to a tidy burst step day, I, I went to uh, the one in Austin and the one in San Fran and they were both great. Um, all right. So <laughs> I think that the answer to this question might be basically um, the book that we're reading. Uh, but so tidy models, 
the website has lots of good articles and examples, but um, because of, uh, I think, because of the many different packages, there's uh, a lot of scatter to that. And is there a central repository uh, to see kind of a, a bigger picture? And like I say, I think that's the book. <laughs> I'm going to give one answer and then Max, I know you're up against time, but maybe you can give yeah. one more answer. Um, <clears throat> so um, I think we do hope that tidy.models.org gives you a bit of a high level view, uh, especially what you need to know to get started. Like, um, um, uh, and, and also like a landing page for here, what the packages are here, what they do. Um, and here's how you get started. And then we think of as, we think the book that you all are reading in the book club as um, it's time to like dig deeper, understand more things conceptually, um, not so much like just le just let me get started. I want to read a whole book, you know, but like like this is for someone who's like, no, I really want to understand more. I, there's more space to explain things. Um, so that's how we think of these two. We our, our goal is that both of these give you what you need to know to use the packages. Um so I'll stop there. So Max, before you have to head off. No, I have a few more minutes. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to be late. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, I can't be. Uh, um, yeah, I think that's good. I think the book, I, I prefer, like if I were starting this, I think I would prefer the book because I prefer like long form documentation. But, um, uh, and we've been focused more on the book because it's unfinished. So, you know, at some point we're going to go back and, oh, right, we should do this for Tony Miles.org and, and really critique and you know and actually that would be great if you put in issues for there like oh you know it'd be great if we had like a, a little you know they're kind of like just vignettes like right. a vignette on like how do we do model explainers or whatever or you know whatever it is so um yeah they're definitely like two different um aspects of the same type of topics so yeah <clears throat> so so that the person who asked us used the word like like i um, like scattered or like I'm trying to figure out like what does what and that is something that we're um, like that is feedback like similar feedback is feedback that we get from people right like from users who are kind of entering and figuring things out and are like wait a minute there's a lot of packages here what do they do how do they relate to each other do I need to know all those things how much do I need to know to get started? And especially depending, I think, on the personality of a person. Like some personalities are like, well, I'm just going to start and figure it out as I go along, which that's definitely my like MO in life is like, well, let's just start. I'll I'll figure it out. You know, I, I probably. <laughs> and um, but if people, some other people maybe who are more like, I need all the information before I get started. Like I need to know why are there nine? Why are there 12? You know, like like why are there so many packages? What do they all do? How do they fit together? Where is that information laid out? Um, so that's something we're still kind of iterating on. Um, how much are we going to emphasize that, um, that issue of the multiple packages? Um, I mean, if you all have read the book and, um, and are kind of around this, you like, you, pro you probably kind of have gotten an idea, like the reason why there are multiple packages like all these packages is because it's, it's it's like help help you help us you know like um uh it's so that um it's so that we can uh, maintain the packages in a more modular way versus having one like monolithic monster of a package and it is so that when you go to like whatever kind of deployment you need to head to for your model. You don't need everything with you, right? You only need the pieces that you need for, say, to make a prediction. Like that's all that needs to go into the Docker container or like just the packages that are used for actually prediction or whatever kind of deployment you need to do. So like those are the main motivation, motivations for breaking up the pieces of tidy models into separate um, packages. Yeah. And there's a crane factor too. Yeah. But I'll brain about that. <laughs> I can do one more like lightning question. Um, I I don't have one right now. Actually, I okay. think uh, that pretty much covers it. Um, I will ask one. Oh, go ahead. For the workflow sets, the auto plot. Uh, it, it's not. I don't think it's just me that notices that <laughs> the levels. They seem weird. Like one, two, three, four. It says recipe and formula. Is there yeah. a better way to label that? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I thought about that quite a bit. So like in in blog posts and stuff like that, which you'll see me do periodically is just use rank results and filter out on the metric I want and then like do like a, a mutate to get the aspects of those things that I want to show up in the plot. The, the, I guess the answer to the question is it's really hard to figure out what pieces of the information that we have ought to be colored by or shaped by and things like that. So the ones that are there are like not the safest choice. I guess they are. Um, they might be good in some instances and not good in other instances. But I but that's a good another example where like maybe like maybe the auto plot for that does like 80% of the cases that people might want. And then you can just like use rank results and make your own GG plot pretty pretty easily. So um yeah. <laughs> um all right. Well uh thank you very much. I guess um you, you you are going off to oh i got another question let's see um how often do you expect users to write custom step or model functions for their tidy models code for instance in in scikit learn it seems like there's a strong role for custom transformers and estimators um yeah i don't know i mean uh it depends on what you're doing like if i were back in drug discovery i probably would have written like a side recipes package to handle like spectral data like data where you have like wavelengths and things like that. Like I can think of like customized things I would want to do. But if it's like, oh, you don't have the random force implementation I like, well then sure, that's not too hard to add that. And it depends on the scope of what you're doing and how it fits or doesn't fit into the framework. Um, I don't know that we have expectations about that. I think maybe the users have expectations for us. Um, we definitely know people are doing it. Um, yeah. uh, and I think that the most people, for most people, it's working pretty well. Um, uh, people who are building custom recipe steps, for example, um, uh, like like that, it, you know, I, that tends to work pretty well, especially if you wrap it in a package that you can then load the namespace. Um, uh, p depending on your tuning and your parallel processing approach, like that's when people have kind of run into problems. But I think that we have um, solved most of those bugs. Bye, Max. Thank you so much. Good luck with your talk. Um, so, so I, so, so certainly you can. So yeah. So, um, so John just pasted in um, our current. Um, sort of long form documentation about how, about how to do this yourself, like how to make your own metric. If you want to use a, a certain metric for tuning that we don't support, how to build your own recipe step. If there's some particular feature or engineering step that you want to, you know, learn from your training data and apply to your test data. So um, we certainly support it and people, we know people are doing it and seem to be there, there have been some rough patches, but I think we've ironed most of those out. The rough patches mostly were related to um, uh, parallel processing. All right. Well, um, I think that's it. I don't see any more coming in. So um, thank you very much for, for coming. And I'm, I'm sorry that we had to go right to the last minute with Max there. Um, so we're going to keep having questions coming in, Sure, uh, I'm sure. Um, Let's see. Well, if you got a, a second for this one, Arjun just asked in the chat, any plan on creating um, recipe for Quantile normalizer similar to Quantile transform and scikit-learn? So. Um, if you mean like Quantile regression, um, which I think is what Quantile transform does, or is that is that the feature engineering Quantile like you, uh, I forget. It's a pre-processing step. Feature oh, okay, okay. You know, somebody talked about, um, I think we have an issue open actually about doing um, uh, like basically doing a kind of um, discrete a discretization that is based on like Tukey's rule, um, which is very much along that those lines. You can currently do step discretize, which goes into bins and uses quantiles to find the bins. So I think you could just do it right now with step discretize, but someone, I think we have an issue open about like the Tukey's rule um, discretization, which you can do by passing in a function to step discretize already. Um, and if someone's wondering about quantile regression, that's the thing that I took out 
of the book that it's like, and maybe someday we'll do quantile regression. I'm like, we're not doing that in like the next year or so. We need to take that out of the book. <laughs> that would be a longer term goal. Like where you're, you're, you're trying to predict, not like a number, but like which quantile does it fall in? Because that, that is just like a whole different, that just changes a lot of things, you know? So that's longer in the future. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I echo what Apoorva says. Um, and I'm not going to take any more because we <laughs> need to wrap up. Um, thank you again. Thank you for coming in. And it's always great. Um, I guess the I'll, I will have one question on the way out of how long do you think it's going to be before you have another chapter up? <laughs> All right. Well, <clears throat> the I mean, I know you guys can see the PRs. Yeah. The, <laughs> <laughs> so I have a half written um, explainer chapter. And um, so that probably within two weeks or so okay. get up and then we're going to make some edits to the, um, the, the, like the trustworthiness, the, the, which is like the applicability stuff based on the explainability. So one has to go in before the other. And um, so a lot of this is a lot of this is coming in. Like we've got some nice work on a lot of this done. And the dimensionality reduction one is fun too. It's all about beans. No. <laughs> it's a data set of beans. It's very, it's very fun. I like it. It's cute. <laughs> very cool. Like, can well, you tell the difference between beans? I, I don't know. I don't know. Turns <laughs> out you could. If I showed you pictures, uh, you totally could tell the difference between the beans. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, 